My presentation this morning is going to cover recordings of public safety officers on duty. Uh, because of the depth of this topic, I'm going to hit the highlights and some key issues. I'm going to put a different spin on things than perhaps what has been provided in the past. Uh, we're going to dive into some of the videos and audio recordings. I'm going to start off with some examples. Uh, before continuing, uh, I have some statistics and information in here uh, from the Iowa Department of Criminal Investigation. Some of the initial slides with background regarding officer-involved shootings actually comes from DCI and then there are some subsequent slides with information from Force Science Institute. Uh, I think it's necessary to provide an overview of the background and some history on officer-involved shootings where these uh, body camera and squad car camera recordings uh, are going to be an issue. And we're also going to talk about third-party recordings of public safety officers while they're on duty uh, later on in the presentation. First video is going to be from Burlington, Iowa, from just this last summer here. If we can get the video to play. We may experience with these body cam videos throughout the presentation. Just want to give some background facts so on officer involved shootings before we dive into the actual uh, body cam and squad car cam videos. There are 392 law enforcement agencies in Iowa, about 9,000 police officers. We don't know exactly how many officers are deployed with body-worn cameras at this time, but we know that 92% of the public nationwide supports equipping officers with body camera videos. In my experience, there are a large number of departments in Iowa that still do not have body camera videos. There are a variety of reasons for that, including budget constraints and other issues but we do know that many departments are uh, working on equipping their officers with body camera uh, and additional squad car camera videos. Uh, most notably, Cedar Rapids is currently in the process of equipping their officers. One of the issues that we see is, particularly these large departments, there may be some officers that have body camera videos and some that do not. And that's still an issue uh, that we're gonna address a little bit later on here. As we go through, these are some statistics provided by the Department of Criminal Investigation. As you see, the number of officer-involved shootings is actually going up from 2010 to 2017 with 11.19 per year. So statistically, we are seeing a rise in uh, officer-involved shootings. Those are typically the cases where the body camera video or squad camera, squad car camera video are actually going to be an issue. However, I, I don't want to live the presentation just to officer-involved shootings. Uh, body camera or squad car camera video can be critical for uh, other incidents, such as motor vehicle collisions involving law enforcement officers, uh, or in any case where there's a significant property loss or where somebody has been hurt or killed. This is a map of the state of Iowa with uh, the stars indicating where officer-involved shootings occurred from 2013 to 2016. Now, statistically, you can see that eastern portion of Iowa, particularly southeast Iowa, has a high number of officer-involved shootings. Northwest Iowa, uh, north central Iowa, there are very few, if any, officer-involved shootings. We see some out of Pottawatomie County, uh, out of Sioux City, and then you have to go over to essentially the Des Moines metro area to find uh, the next cluster of officer involved shootings. Now, if you look at Iowa's larger cities, there is a box in the Dubuque area. And one interesting point is, is that Dubuque has not had any officer involved shootings from 2013 to 2016. So uh, usually we're seeing these shootings in larger Iowa cities. However, that's not always the case. Uh, Dubuque has not had one uh, during that period of time. So here's the bar chart and you can see that generally speaking the officer involved shootings are on the rise. Uh, if you look at 2016 they were a little bit higher. Uh, we don't have 2017's numbers yet uh, but I believe that they did go down uh, according to my last inquiry with DCI about that. So looking at the uh, justification for officer-involved shootings, uh, if you look at the uh, justification for the officer's actions, 
The suspect shot at the officer. It happened 11 times. Uh, suspect pointed, reached, advanced weapon at officer 20 times. Vehicle driven at officer, that occurred 15 times. And that's kind of an interesting statistic that we'll talk about here in a moment. Uh, subject with a knife. That was a couple officers we represented. The dog is the Burlington police officer's incident from 2015. And then an unarmed uh, advance, hands, feet, and fists. So officer was fighting for the officer's life. So in reviewing the cases, 58% of them were viewed by the county attorney, 22% by the Iowa Attorney General's office, 11% by a grand jury. That's typically here in Polk County. And 11, uh, excuse me, 7% were no ruling. Out of all those cases, the justification for the officer's actions 100% of the time came back that the officer's use of force was reasonable. So there's not been a case in Iowa in recent history, or to my knowledge, ever where an officer's actions were found to be unreasonable uh, in the situation. Now, Iowa has an interesting situation that doesn't necessarily track with the entire country. We have a number of officer-involved shootings where officers are shooting at moving vehicles. If you look at the PERF recommendations, uh, the police chiefs actually recommend uh, placing in department policy that officers do not fire at moving vehicles. Uh, we disagree with that policy in the sense that if an officer uh, is in danger uh, of being injured or if somebody else is being in danger of being injured, then the officer should be able to use uh, deadly force if necessary to mitigate the threat. The recent DRI conference that I was at in New Orleans, some other departments are seeing rises in officer involved shootings involving vehicles. Just last year, we had one in a, a Southeast Iowa County involving two, two deputies. So these are happening. Uh, they are happening at a rate that's greater than uh, a lot of other places in the country, but we have to avoid the knee jerk reaction to put in policy restrictions on officers defending themselves or defending other people because when these body camera videos come out and somebody's looking at that policy, they're looking to see what, what the policy allows and does not allow. And if they say you have a policy that says you shall not fire at a moving vehicle, that's just gonna be something that's gonna allow the media and the court of uh, public opinion to essentially convict the officer and the department before they've even had an opportunity to uh, defend themselves. One of the big things that I want to emphasize here today is, is that we as attorneys have to prepare for these incidents and we have to get out there and really understand how this technology works, the issues that are going on. We have to be uh, ahead of the curve and the technology is rapidly advancing. Uh, now we have camera systems where an officer's body camera, squad car camera are, are linked together. And so if officer activates the body camera, it turns on the rest of the cameras. We have some systems that are multiple camera systems. So there's a body camera, a forward facing squad car camera and side or rear facing squad car cameras. So understanding that you may get different perspectives, uh, we have to understand how that technology works, how it links up and, and how that's gonna play to a, a judge and a jury. Another huge point that I wanna make today is that a lot of these issues are gonna be played out in the media. And we know that from the Burlington incidents that there was a lot of media coverage. There was a recent case here in Des Moines. And then I have a, here in front of me a news article. Uh, it says, West Des Moines police won't release video from alleged wrongful arrest. We have to be out in front of these issues before they happen. We have to know how this technology works, what the public, we know these records requests are gonna come. We know that they're gonna ask for the video. Uh, we need to have some kind of game plan in place. In some situations, it may actually be advisable to hire a media consultant, particularly in places that are small, small counties, small cities. Uh, there's a case down in Texas, it's Betty Shelby. If you Google that, uh, the Fraternal Order of Police spent $50,000 in media consultants in that case because there was a wrongful narrative that was put out in social media and in the press just to get the record straight. So this is something that we need to consider uh, just to represent our clients and try to be out in front of these issues. Uh, one of the things that's no longer acceptable is the you know, no comment. That doesn't work anymore. The public expects more. They expect some kind of explanation from us on, uh, on these videos, why they're not being released, what the process is for releasing the videos, uh, when that video will be released, if it will be released. Uh, that's all stuff that we need to think about before the 
officer-involved shooting or criti critical incident occurs. So just some general contributing factors uh, for officers' use of force or officer-involved shootings. One of the things that we're seeing is the length of the officer shift. Uh, in a lot of these cases, once the plaintiff's attorney does discovery, they will typically ask for uh, records concerning the officer's shift schedule, whether the officer is working overtime, how long the officer's been working, how much sleep the officer had, uh, particularly in cases where the officer's been working 12 or longer hours. Uh, obviously, you know, if they're tired, that can influence their ability to make decisions, and that can be an issue. Uh, the officer's physical and mental condition, that's always going to be an issue in these types of cases. A uh, big one is training and experience. Uh, the, the first video that we showed was from Burlington. Uh, there were two officers in that squad car, and the first officer had been on the job for, I believe, about three weeks. So a very short period of time. So the officer's training and experience is absolutely going to be a question. More narrowly tailored to the actual issue of body cameras, uh, what training has the officer had with the body cameras? What training has the officer had with the software? Has, has there been any training for the attorneys? What about for the city staff? Those are all questions that people are going to ask when, when one of these situations occurs. We talk about officer job satisfaction, work stress. That, that is a factor, probably not a huge factor, but that is somewhat of a factor. Uh, one of the, the big factors for us is poorly drafted policies, guidelines, and procedures. Uh, we're going to talk about policies, guidelines, and procedures a little bit later on, but in some cases we have departments that have the policies, uh, but these policies were taken from Google, uh, from other departments from out of state. They don't necessarily comply with Iowa law or they're inconsistent with best practices or they're simply out of date. And then we have environmental factors, whether uh, that was the second video a clip with the dog. So just, I'm gonna kind of fly through some of this material. Uh, Dr. Dr. Artwall, uh, we need to understand that there are gonna be a variety of things going through an officer's mind uh, in the immediate aftermath of an officer-involved shooting. Uh, just as a natural occurrence, the officer is gonna second guess his or her actions. That happens. Uh, they're not going to be able to remember every single detail that played out. They're going to see things and hear things that the body camera or the squad car camera didn't record. So in some situations, the uh, officer may have a statement that appears on its face to be inconsistent with the actual recording, but in fact, the recording may not have picked up what the officer was observing or sensing in person. We have to take that into account when we're reviewing these videos as attorneys. Uh, because you may think, oh, we have a problem here. We have some exposure in this case. Well, that may not be the case. It may be explainable. We just have to do some more investigation and digging. In situations where these types of cases are litigated in state or federal court under Section 1983, we turn to the case of Graham v. O'Connor. I put this case law in here just briefly, just to emphasize that just because we have these body camera and squad car camera videos, it's not a license to second guess or Monday morning quarterback the officer. And that's what we're seeing in court. We're seeing that in the court of public opinion. Uh, we have to remember though, that the officer is gonna be judged by uh, the facts and circumstances known to the officer at the time. And they're gonna be the courts are going to be looking towards what the officer knew, and they're not going to be going with the second, uh, second guessing or 2020 hindsight that seems to occur with these, these videos. I like this quote uh, from the Sixth Circuit. We must avoid substituting our personal notions of proper police procedure for the instantaneous decision of the officer at the scene. We must never allow the theoretical, sanitized world of our imagination to replace the dangerous and complex world that policemen face every day. What constitutes reasonable action may seem quite different to someone facing a possible assailant than to someone analyzing the question at leisure. So we're all able to comfortably review these videos and audio recordings from our officers, offices. But the officer at the scene is facing a completely different situation and in a matter of seconds has to decide whether to use force what amount of force to use, and is trying to take in a lot of different information and make, make decisions based on that information under stressful circumstances. As the Third Circuit has pointed out, Monday morning quarterbacking is not allowed. Uh, and one of the big things that we emphasize in these types of cases is that officers do have that breathing room and they can make reasonable mistakes. The question is always whether those mistakes were reasonable. 
So that has to be taken into account when we're reviewing these recordings. I just want to briefly talk about the public's perception of police. Again, this is from the DCI, and I, and I like this a lot because uh, one of the big things that people think is, is an officer is going to be able to regurgitate everything that happened just based on the video and audio recordings. And when an officer does not remember you know, a, a key detail that happened, somehow the officer is lying or the officer uh, doesn't accurately recall what happened. That's not the case at all. A lot of times the officers in these stressful situations are focused in on something. It's that tunnel vision. If it's a person with a the gun, they're focused in on, on the gun. If it's a person with a knife, they're focused on the knife. Uh, we have situations in videos where we can point to an officer seeing, uh, seeing a suspect with a firearm or a knife and then not seeing the background, you know, a tanker truck that's full of gasoline uh, driving behind it. And you ask the officer, did you see that? No, I didn't. Well, why is that? Because the officer was locked in on the threat. So to think that an officer is going to be able to accurately recall everything uh, in the immediate aftermath or even down the road from a shooting or a critical incident is just not the case. That's part of the thing that we have to do as attorneys, particularly when it comes to media inquiries. We have to educate them not only on the science behind it, but just the, the process so they have an understanding and we get our narrative out there because the other side is going to have their narrative. The people that want to file uh, claims or if they want to disparage the officer, the city, the, the county, the department, uh, they're going to have their narrative. But so many times we say no comment. Uh, this matter is pending investigation. Well, uh, that's really dependent on the facts and circumstances of each case. There are times where no comment is appropriate, but we do need to get out there at some point and educate people on the process and, and what's going on. Uh, particularly the way that move, the media moves these days, things happen within minutes, hours. Tweets, Facebook, uh, social media, we're not staying ahead of that curve right now. So we need to be cognizant of that and try to do a little bit better job of uh, getting out there and, and having some media relations early on. The officer's experience, so there's just some slides here about selective attention, pupil dilation, auditory exclusion, time distortion. I can't tell you how many times that we've interviewed officers uh, following officer involved shootings and they state, well, the suspect was approximately 10, 15 feet away from me. Well, as it turned out, the suspect was five, six feet away. Uh, in these situations where they're under an immense amount of stress, they're going to be inaccuracies with, with distance, time. Things literally slow down to where uh, you, you feel like it was forever went by. Um, I know in my experience as a fire captain, People always used to tell me, you know, what took you so long to get to our call? Even if it took us two minutes from the time that we were dispatched, for them, it feels like a long time, especially when they're calling 911. That same thing is happening with officers. They're, they're literally slowing down the brain process and seeing things uh, in slow motion. About selective attention, uh, you can see here that the officer perceives the passenger as a new threat because he didn't see the driver's weapon when he removed his coat. So he's locking in on uh, the one threat, but doesn't see a second threat. Uh, and that's just because of the stressful situation that the officers encounter. So we talked about pupillary dilation, um, you know, just some background on this. A lot of times we see officers that they may not see something, but the video actually picked it up on the recording. So people say, well, how could you have not seen that? because the officer's locked in on something else. Sometimes just because it's on a video doesn't necessarily mean that the officer saw it or should have seen it. It really depends on the, the situation. And again, the inability to accurately gauge distance. Auditory ex exclusion. Uh, sometimes officers are gonna hear things that the video recording does not pick up or vice versa. Um, a lot of times we have videos that the sound on it is muffled, it's distant, um, particularly in situations where there are shots fired. Sometimes if those shots are fired from a distance, the recording won't even pick those up, but the officer heard them. And so if the officer states in his report and, or in uh, his DCI interview that he heard shots, but it's not picked up on the recording, there's gonna be people questioning whether those shots were actually fired. We also have a lot of inaccurate statements about number of shots fired, commands given. One of the things that I want to emphasize with these videos is just because we can't see what's on the video, the audio is just as key. And so officers are trained 
to continue to give verbal commands. You heard the, the first video from Burlington police officers, and while you couldn't see the suspect with a firearm, you heard him say, Chip, he's got a gun. You heard him say, drop the gun. So that's, that's the stuff that helps when we're doing uh, these well, when we're defending the officers in these DCI investigations or in civil litigation are the verbal commands. They're just as important as the visual uh, observations that the camera picks up. This is what I was referring to about time slowing down. Um, we really don't want to get into how long a, a situation took or how long a, it took for uh, situation to develop just because the officer more than likely is not going to be able to accurately gauge that information. So for attorneys, uh, in the aftermath of an officer-involved shooting or a critical incident, one of the key things, uh, especially if you get that call, if you're a city county attorney, you get that call at three o'clock in the morning, you know, from the chief of police, uh, our officer was just involved in officer-involved shooting. Well, first thing is, is that officer should not speak with anybody besides you. And one of the first things that we recommend you say is, you know, exercise your right to remain silent. And there's a Salinas case from 2013 from the United States Supreme Court talking about uh, officers or uh, individuals affirmatively invoking their right to remain silent. Uh, in other states, we're seeing uh, certain jury instructions where officers did not necessarily invoke their right to remain silent and didn't make any statements. So they just remained silent. And then when it came down to the trial, the prosecutor uh, asked the judge for an instruction regarding the officer remaining silent, and that instruction was given. This happened in the Betty Shelby case in Texas, and I'll just read for you the instruction that was actually given by the trial court judge to the jury. Evidence has been introduced that the defendant did not make a formal statement to police on the date of the shooting. Jurors may not consider this impeachment evidence as proof of innocence or guilt, but may consider it a factor in determining what weight and credit to give the credibility of the defendant, Betty Shelby. So we have situations where officers may be uh, branded as guilty, either in the court of public opinion or that may weigh against the officer with the jury down the road at trial, just based on the officer remaining silent. So one of the things that we are now advising officers to do is affirmatively state to the supervisor and the other officers that are responding while the recordings are still going that I'm affirmatively invoking my right to remain silent. However, at some future point in time, I may wish to provide a statement to DCI. And that way the officer is keeping an open mind and is not saying I'm not gonna talk to you at all because the fact of the matter is those are voluntary interviews. Uh, it, it's totally within the officer's right to say, no, I don't want to talk to you. Uh, I would just prefer to exercise my right to remain silent and not get an interview. I'm not aware of a single case where an officer has declined to provide an interview to DCI, though. I believe the vast majority of the officers do that. It just typically happens after the uh, officers had at least 48 hours to sleep. So uh, this is something that we need to consider because uh, down the road, if that video and audio recording gets released and we have a, a recording where an officer is immediately invoking their right to remain silent, the public is not necessarily going to understand why the officer is invoking their right to remain silent. That may to some uh, seem like it was some kind of wrongdoing on behalf of the officer. So we'll have to get out in front of that and educate the public. Now, more than likely that video and audio recording is not going to be released you know, certainly in within 48 hours after the incident has taken place because it's an ongoing investigation. Uh, certainly, I, I doubt that uh, the media could get a hold of those, those recordings even within the weeks after an officer-involved shooting. But what we have to consider is, is while that may not impact the immediate criminal investigation in the officer's conduct, we have uh, potential civil litigation down the road, and we also have an internal affairs situation that's gonna uh, come from the department into the officer's conduct. So those may not be issues in a criminal case, but they certainly could be issues in civil litigation or in administrative proceedings as part of the internal affairs investigation. One of the things that I get a lot of calls on from other attorneys is, hey, I, I don't have any experience with this. Um, you know, what do you think about this? And these, these cases are complex and they're getting more complex just based on the technology and uh, a lot of the issues that we're seeing as far as uh, issues with dealing with the media uh, post-Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, Missouri. So, 
you know, if you get one of these cases or if you're a city county attorney and you get one of these situations, consider bringing an outside counsel. That also protects you ethically uh, because there may be situations where you can't represent the department and the officer. And uh, certainly uh, you do not want to get an ethics complaint from a police officer that thinks that uh, you did not adequately represent their interest following an officer involved shooting or critical incident. Here is a big point. Uh, do not have post shooting conversations with an officer involved when the audio and video recordings are still rolling. I have some squad car videos where an officer has talked to an attorney or supervisor and that call uh, was picked up by the squad car or body camera video recordings. Even the cell phone, because the volume was turned up so loud, the microphones are so sensitive that you could hear exactly what the other party was stating to the officer and have the entire conversation. Certainly, we don't want our advice and conversation to be on a recording that could eventually become a public record. So one of the first things we always ask officers is, is are you in a place, a private place where you can talk? Are there any squad car, body camera recordings, audio devices that are on at this time? If the officer is calling you, sometimes we get calls at four o'clock in the morning. If they're calling you from the scene of a, a officer involved shooting, uh, we always ask you know, that question. Sometimes you don't get the call until the next day or two days later, and that's not so much of an issue, but we do have to be cognizant of that. One of the key things that we see is sometimes supervisors from departments that don't have the specific training will come and they will instruct an officer to immediately go write a written report. That is not a good idea. And in fact, if DCI is involved, some departments don't have DCI do the investigation. For example, Scott County typically will have Davenport PD or vice versa do their investigations uh, because they're large enough. But the vast majority of departments are going to probably have DCI doing the investigation. Uh, we don't want them writing a written report. All the facts and circumstances will come out during the DCI investigation. DCI is going to do a fair and impartial investigation. They're going to be thorough. They do a very good job. We want the officer to explain what happened to DCI in those interviews, and then you can use that final report from DCI as the, as the officer's written report. So if we have department policies, some department policies actually state an officer will write a written report after each incident before the officer completes their shift. We need to get out in front of those policies and look at them and consider changing them and putting an exception in there for critical incidents. The next key point is instructing the department and officer to not review the video or audio recordings before the attorney speaks with the officer that's involved. This is because uh, the video and audio recordings, they're actually, have had, I have cases right now where we have errors with the, with the recordings and those recordings can actually taint the officer's memory recollection. And there's actually some scientific research and studies that are going on right now about this very issue. There are a couple different doctors out there that are saying uh, listen, we don't want the officers reviewing the, the videos beforehand because the officer may re remember it accurately, but then review the video and change the officer's story to the video based on what the officer thought the video shows, even if the officer's recollection is inconsistent with the video. Because a lot of people think, well, if that's what the video shows, then the video is accurate. Well, the videos themselves have had a lot of issues, and, and I'll talk about those here in a little bit. but we don't have a problem with officers reviewing the video before the DCI interview. You just want the officer to talk to the attorney first, let the attorney take the officer's statement, uh, do the interview, and then the officer and the attorney can review the video together prior to the DCI interview. Obviously, you want to try to obtain copies for your file, but you know if you're worried about open records requests or other types of issues, uh, it seems like the videos are getting passed around like hot potatoes right now, and nobody wants to keep them in their files just because of some of the ongoing issues with uh, litigation and Iowa Code Chapter 22. I'm going to talk about the actual limitations with the body-worn cameras now. Uh, I'm just going to show a video here. This video actually comes from Baltimore, Maryland. And the 
video itself isn't clear until you actually slow down the video and look at it in a, a very slow, almost frame by frame analysis to see the suspect turning and pointing the firearm at the officer. But when that's played full speed in the press or online and people can manipulate these videos to play them faster and that's actually happened in other cases to make it look like the officer did something wrong but when it's played uh, in that slow motion you can clearly see that this is a justified shooting a suspect is pointing a firearm at a police officer so it ultimately was determined to be a, uh, a justified shooting but one of the questions that remains is well, what's what's happening with the video and why is there no audio at the beginning uh, the prosecutor or the attorney for the city there was indicating that there's buffering mode. So when a police officer activates the body camera video, that can go backwards, say 30 seconds, 60 seconds. But when it does that, there's not going to be any audio on most of these cameras. So we have to be able to explain why there's no audio. It's not a case where the officer is simply putting his hand over the mic uh, or is trying to hide something. That's the way the technology works. That's one thing that's bad if the officer, ha if something happens so quickly that an officer is not able to turn on the, the video, then it's not gonna pick up the audio recordings. He's giving the guy verbal commands to drop the gun, stop police, but that's not picked up just because of the way that the technology worked in these cases. So that's one thing that we need to be cognizant of as attorneys. Obviously the body cams, I mean, the, the camera is not recording the actual officer's view. I mean, they're different mounting options. You can mount it on your chest, you can mount it on your epaulet. They have some that go on glasses, but the, the camera itself is not seeing what the officers see. It doesn't track what with the officer's head and eye movements. Uh, some things, like I indicated before, are just not gonna be picked up on the, the body camera. The sounds, the sights, the, the Gunfire has a very distinct sound. Uh, you can smell gunpowder. You, you know, trained police officers know these things. Um, they can tell, but the body camera is not going to pick that up. Obviously, we have the camera speed differs from the speed of real life. And that's something a lot of people don't understand. These cameras uh, don't necessarily paint a completely accurate picture of what happened because real life moves a lot faster than those, those video cameras. And you can manipulate the video to slow it down or speed it up or uh, really go uh, contrary to how the officer saw things in real life. And then in low light situations, I know that there's a Des Moines video here from recently involving an officer involved shooting that was released. And when you look at that video, it's dark out, it's night. Uh, you know, some of these videos have different night vision uh, and they're able to see a little bit better maybe than some police officers are. So an officer seeing something dark, something in the dark may think that it's a firearm and it might be somebody having a cell phone in their hand where on the video, it's clearly a cell phone just because the camera was actually better than the officer's vision. It's just something that we need to think about. Obviously the camera is only recording in 2D. And even when we have multiple cameras, that may not be sufficient to show what exactly the officer saw from the officer's perspective. The camera is, is providing a perspective, but that may not be the officer's perspective. Regardless, it, it, the cameras are not the end all be all. We still have to do a complete investigation. We have to go beyond what the camera shows and look and see what's not explained by the video. What's missing from this video? What, what are we looking at here uh, that we can see on the video but is inconsistent with the officer and why is that the case? As I was talking about before, the video does encourage Monday morning quarterback and second guessing of the, of the officers. And that's exactly what the law does not allow under Graham v. O'Connor. So if we're in federal court or state court in a Section 8, 1983 civil rights type case, you know, the, the judge or the jury, they're going to view this from the, the reasonable officer perspective. They're not going to engage in Monday morning quarterbacking and try to uh, beat the officer up over every little thing that is or isn't on the video. But that's something that we still have to address with the media. A huge problem with this technology is, is you have body cameras, we have the hardware, which those cameras can cost $200 to $1,000 roughly. And the, the cameras, I mean, they're, is, they're smaller than a cell phone. And that technology, like any other technology, is subject to failure, malfunction, and other issues. What happens when the equipment fails? Are, as attorneys, are we ready for that? Are we ready to explain that? Um, do we have any kind of guideline, policy, procedure on that? Uh, is the department prepared for those failures and malfunctions? Because inevitably, I hear this a lot, uh, people seem to think that 
because there was a malfunction, you know, there was some kind of cover up or wrongdoing. We need to be able to get the experts involved quickly and to actually point to an actual issue with the video or audio recording, whether it's a software issue, whether it's a hardware issue, and just so we can get out in front of these things before they actually turn into a, a major situation. Sometimes if we get out in front of it, I think that we can prevent litigation from happening. And then is the malfunction, is it a malfunction or is it the normal operation of the camera? From the last video I just showed, there was no audio because it was in buffer mode. So we as attorneys have to understand how this technology works to know that the, the technology itself was functioning properly in that case. That is a normal function of the equipment. I wanna talk briefly about some policy issues. First question is, do we even have a policy on officer involved shootings or critical incidents with our police department? Because be, they should, and some departments don't have a policy. Uh, sometimes it's covered, you know, uh, between a hodgepodge of policies, but we absolutely should have a policy in place. Uh, if, they, if they don't, uh, there are things that you can do to try to help them uh, facilitate uh, and guide them through uh, an officer-involved shooting. I know DCI has information um, they're willing to share with uh, law enforcement departments on what to expect in the case of an officer-involved shooting, and there's other resources that are out there. One thing I would caution everybody on is, is taking a policy that was developed on a national letter level and try to take that and just incorporate that into the police department. I see a lot of departments, uh, sheriffs, chief deputies, chiefs of police, command officers that call me and say, listen, I got this from this department. Well, it's coming from Arizona, California. It's been modified. It doesn't meet Iowa law. It's never been through the legal review process. Uh, sometimes they're hiring national consultants or policy experts to come in and provide them a policy manual. Generally, those policy manuals are good, uh, but there are issues that need to be addressed specific to Iowa uh, because we have some unique laws here, especially when we start getting into state tort law claims uh, that need to be addressed. And obviously our own open record statute needs to be addressed with some of these policy issues. One of the key questions when we're talking about recordings of officers is how and when should the officer turn on the body cam? And that's a huge debate. Uh, some department policies indicate that it should be a situation where an officer uh, has a, an incident. Well, incident's not defined, uh, but basically uh, it's an incident or it's any contact with the public. So officers are expected to have those body cameras rolling all the time. The problem with that is, is these cameras have limited space. And even if they're going back to the uh, police department, downloading the video and audio recordings, uh, you know, one, is the technology gonna even allow the officer to use the camera for a full 10, 12 hour shift? Sometimes those batteries die. And then when a real critical incident happens and you need to have it on a recording, uh, the, the technology doesn't work because the battery's dead or it's out of space because our SD cards are full because we're recording so much information. Then the question becomes, when should the officer turn off the body camera? Uh, in an officer involved situation, we have uh, some departments that say, leave it on all the way through. Some departments that say, you can have a supervisor come to the scene and once the supervisor advises you to terminate the, the body camera or squad car recording, that's fine. Uh, I tend to like the latter. I think that once the officer is out of the fray of the incident and is away from the incident, then that's a good opportunity to turn off the recording device. I'm gonna read a couple of different policies here. This is from the University of Iowa Department of Public Safety's policy. It says, once activated, the portable recorder should remain on continuously until the member reasonably believes that his or her direct participation in the incident is complete or the situation no longer fits the criteria for activation. The recording may be stopped during significant periods of inactivity, such as report writing or other breaks from direct participation in the incident. The problem I have with that is, is when a member reasonably believes his or her direct participation in the incident is complete. That's pretty subjective and doesn't really give a guideline or standard for officers to, to follow. And that's a whole nother can of worms with disciplinary action. Uh, but I understand that some, uh, some people drafting these policies have deliberately done that to be vague, but that actually can create more issues. Turning to the city of Cedar Rapids, uh, their policy indicates officers shall activate the body-worn camera to regard all contacts with citizens in the performance of official duties 
and then they provide a list to include. That's a little bit better in the sense that it provides some guidance uh, of different situations where officers should have their recordings on. But there are some situations like we saw from the Burlington video where things happen so fast officers aren't able to get their, their video and audio recordings activated soon enough. There needs to be some leeway for the officers to account for those rapidly evolving situations. What's the department's policy regarding reviewing body camera videos? So does the department have a policy in place that says we're randomly going to review the officer's videos and if we find policy violations, we're going to write the officer? Or is it a complaint-based review or is it an incident-based review? Uh, some departments do have practices where they only review it if there's a critical incident or if there's an incident uh, subject to litigation or a criminal case or there's a complaint. However, that process is identified by a particular department, it should be in writing, so there is some notice and disclosure of what that practice is, not only for the officer, but for the, but for the public as well. How and when uh, can the officer's video be used to discipline them? Um, this is a big question right now. Um, do they need to have some kind of notice? Do they need to be given an opportunity to uh, correct their report if the department reviewing the report thinks, well, the officer made misstatements, there's inaccuracies, you know, should they have an opportunity to go back and make changes? Uh, those are things that we need to consider with department policies. Then another big one, so should the officer review the video following an officer involved shooting? We believe yes, before the DCI interview, absolutely, but I don't want the officer reviewing before the officer talks to me. I want to have an opportunity to talk to the officer before they uh, are able to go back and look at the video and that way we don't run into issues with the video tainting the officer's memory. Regarding collective bargaining, uh, I put some sample CBA language in here from City of Columbus. So one of the things that I think we're going to see if you negotiate collective bargaining agreements uh, where departments are, are going to have to start addressing this with their contracts with the police unions. Um, there needs to be some kind of leeway for some of these random reviews because you could come back and Monday morning quarterback every decision of a police officer. After a while, you're not gonna have anybody that wants to do the job anymore because they're gonna feel so scrutinized uh, that it's not even worth uh, performing the duties anymore. So yes, we need to address serious incidents and uh, deal with those through the disciplinary process, but minor policy violations that are found during random review uh, should be addressed and provide some kind of uh, guidance to the department and officers in, in the department's policies. Some contracts, like this Columbus one, say that the recording cannot start uh, before 60 seconds, so at the max is 60 seconds. Um, they have to provide, the department has to provide the officer training with the system prior to implementing it. That's a huge thing. We are not providing enough training to attorneys or officers for these systems. And then when they come into court, they're unable to explain how it works to a judge or jury. Uh, that's a huge issue right now in criminal cases, particularly as the technology is outpacing uh, the training that's currently provided. So they actually required in their CBA that the policy prohibits the remote activation. So some of the technology for safety reasons allows the department to activate the recording remotely and see what the officer is seeing and hear what the uh, officer is hearing. Um, that probably should be addressed because the technology is already here and I have not seen a policy in the state of Iowa or a CBA in Iowa personally where that has been uh, dealt with. And then this is just a good practice, but it also may be required under the uh, Iowa, new Iowa Code section 22.15 uh, for disciplinary matters. Uh, but we should be providing the officers at least some notice uh, prior to release of any video that's not considered a public record or for that matter, videos that are considered public record. DCI is not gonna release the name of the officers that are involved in a shooting until they've actually been interviewed in, in the interview process. So. That's not going to get out there unless, you know, somebody from the public names them or witnesses name them, but DCI is not going to do that. And then if the, the recording is going to be uh, disseminated to the public by the department, they should approach the officer and say, we're going to, we're going to provide this. We're going to go ahead and release even a portion of this video because then the officer may wish to try to pursue an injunction to restrain the department from uh, allowing examination of that video or releasing it. In some situations, the officer's attorney can work with the city attorney or county attorney 
and that can actually be something that's uh, good uh, if there's a court order there uh, that can actually work to everybody's uh, best interest because now you have a judge that is providing that that video shall not be released um, but that's a case-by-case -case situation and I have personally not had the opportunity to try that out the third party recording of police this is a huge issue right now um, I am not aware of any Iowa cases that are pending on it, but it, the wave is coming to Iowa. It's just a matter of time. The First Amendment absolutely protects the people uh, right to record or photograph law enforcement officers while they're doing their duties. The big thing with that is it's subject to reasonable time, place, and manner restrictions. So if an officer is on a traffic stop and somebody pulls up and decides that they want to follow the officer up right behind the officer while they're talking at the window of the other person's car, you know, that's an officer safety situation. So we have seen out of state cases where courts have said, no, that's no First Amendment violation. You can't do that. Uh, we've also seen some situations here in Iowa that did not get litigated, but where officers charged uh, individuals that were interfering with interference with official acts. So there are situations where uh, the First Amendment uh, does not give somebody the right to record uh, law enforcement, but usually that's uh, a fairly narrow set of circumstances. Open records requests, because there have been so many presentations on those in the past, I just, I put this in here because the, the big one that we use to uh, shield the videos and audio recordings from disclosure is 22.7 subsection 5 for peace officer investigative reports. One thing that I thought was interesting about the, the code is 22.7 sub 60 with closed section information. And then if you go to 21.5 and you look at a couple of those subsections, there may be situations where a city attorney or a county attorney needs to speak with the governing body in closed session about those video and audio recordings, whether it's for litigation or whether it's for uh, imminent litigation. And they may not want to uh, disclose those recordings to the public at that time. Huge issue right now, and I've got a case currently that's on appeal to Iowa Supreme Court regarding attorney's fees. Uh, one of the big things is in these cases, they're allowed uh, to request attorney's fees and the court shall provide them attorney's fees if they're successful in open records litigation. And, you know, the question becomes, what's a reasonable attorney fee? Well, in the particular case that we have right now, uh, the hourly rate of the attorney was $400 an hour. And, you know, when you look at this uh, across Iowa, I think a lot of people would be shocked at $400 an hour hourly rate. So cities may have to take that into consideration or counties may have to take that into consideration when they're receiving these open records requests. What are the costs going to be if, this, if we lose ultimately on this? Uh, one thing that I thought was interesting is, is some people are choosing to not uh, utilize the uh, IPIB and they're choosing to just file in district court from the outset. And that's unfortunate because IPIB can typically expedite the process and uh, it's usually a lot quicker than going to district court and a lot less costly. But there's obviously an incentive for some to pursue attorney's fees. So we need to be cognizant of that. Uh, I think that these are going to be bigger issues that are coming down the road, particularly as we see more district courts awarding attorney's fees, especially in higher amounts. I know that employment law litigation, there's several cases are on appeal to the Iowa Supreme Court right now. Uh, in one case out of Powashee County, uh, plaintiff's attorneys in, in that case were given $615,000 $615, for the uh, attorney's fees. Obviously, I don't think that that would happen in an open records case, but this is something that uh, needs to be addressed, particularly if the municipality uh, if their insurance carrier does not cover attorney fee awards. So preventing release of the examination, uh, this is what I was referring to earlier, uh, 22.8. So maybe an officer wants to try to go and prevent the video from being released to the public or the audio recording from being released to the public. Officers are going to have to show examination would clearly not be in the public interest and it would substantially and irreparably injure any person or persons. And there's a variety of reasons how that could do that. I, mean, I think of uh, officers and their ability to get other jobs. Um, that, that's one of the first things I always think of is how is this going to impact their ability to move on from one department to another. But there also may be other privacy concerns there. One of the big things that we see is, is uh, and I can emphasize, is don't be complacent about 
possible civil claims. If you're getting a records request from a, another attorney in, in a case where there's a critical incident, officer involved shooting, motor vehicle collision involving law enforcement, that should be a huge yellow flag. Uh, typically then after that, the lawsuit's coming and it's just a generally a good practice to notify the insurance carrier. We have a lot of cases where we're doing legal review early and getting out ahead of these incidents and trying to gather up everything and uh, defend the incident and the lawsuit before the lawsuit's actually filed. So that's something that you can add to your toolbox. The last section here is just disciplinary action. I just want to emphasize that police officers don't lose their constitutional, statutory, or other legal rights just because they're police officers. And this goes back to Garrity v. State of New Jersey from 1967, but we also have the Peace Officer Bill of Rights here in, in Iowa under Iowa Code Chapter 80F, uh, subsection 1. One of the huge issues right now uh, with disciplinary action is, is uh, with officers' videos and their written reports being inconsistent. Uh, departments are really having a difficulty narrowing down whether an officer was just simply mistaken, whether they were lying, you know, what, what the story was. And that's a huge uh, issue right now in employment law for, for police officers. And I think we're going to continue to see those types of issues, particularly with technology. Uh, departments can't always go out there and replace their body cameras. So in some cases, an officer may not be able to turn on the body camera video. But did the officer ever report to the department that my equipment's malfunctioning or non-functional? So that needs to be in the records and needs to be addressed. Officers obviously have the right to counsel. Uh, that's under ADF 1, subsection 6. And then they also have the right to counsel under uh, Iowa Constitution and uh, under the United States Constitution. The right to counsel is pretty important in these officer-involved shooting cases and in these critical incidents because counsel can do a lot to get out in front of and prevent uh, issues from arising uh, that if they're left basically to fend for themselves, they're certainly going to arise, whether it's in the court of public opinion or internally with the department and issues with disciplinary action. Obviously, we don't want people putting anything in written reports that's going to be used against them down the road in the media or in court. And as the good rule of thumb, don't put anything in writing that you don't want uh, to judge or jury or the media to see. So counsel can help facilitate that process and ensure that uh, people are trying to document things appropriately and not uh, putting poor information in, in written reports or other documentation. Uh, last slide, departments and officers are going to be in, uh, subject to intense media scrutiny. We really have to get out in front of this. We have to educate ourselves on uh, appropriate uh, action uh, immediately and not wait for a critical incident to happen. We need to try to get out and understand the technology, understand what the officers are facing, understand the process for DCI, know what, what the process is going to involve. And if if you as an attorney have questions, there are tons of people out there that are willing to help, whether it's your local police department, DCI, I'm always available. Uh, the insurance carriers tend to have some good information. The big thing is be proactive, not reactive, because there, there's a lot of different uh, issues that can come up in the, these types of uh, matters and litigation that could be resolved early on if somebody was able to get out in front of them. With that, I will take any questions that anybody has. Uh, my contact information is posted here. Certainly, you can email me or call me.